recording is in progress, and I am here today with Sully. Everybody knows him as Sully. I don't think he was born as Sully. It's probably more like the Sean Sullivan, but if you get to know him for, I'd say, anywhere between five to ten minutes, you would understand how people give him a nickname, and he just, he exudes like such positivity. It's amazing when you're around him. Like I'm, I'm normally hyped. People who know me know that. But when you're around other people that like kind of share that same kind of like yes, um, <laughs> uh, feeling, then it, it, you can't help but like just, just want to give him a big hug. So I'm going to before I start ranting, I'm going to talk about things that OCB wise Sully is doing because he has more shows coming up, right? I do. All right. So I don't want to bypass that. We'll start right off with those. What's your next show? Give me some uh, the next one. I'm, the next one I'm promoting is the Hall of Fame. It's going to be in July in Springfield. And this uh, the, the Hall of Fame is a pro-am. So I will have the uh, pro women's uh, body build. Um, well, pro women's uh, bikini, pro women's figure and pro women's um, uh, physique. And also all the amateur divisions and to include our new wellness division. So I'm really looking forward to that debut novice open in, in the master's classes. Uh, but every year at the Hall of Fame, we also induct somebody into the OCB Hall of Fame. And the show was started by uh, um, Frank Porcella. And uh, I was <laughs> I was actually inducted one year. Uh, so the show uh, the, the show was kind of near and dear to my heart, not for that reason, but because of the intent. And the intent is to recognize people uh, who have had a history in the sport and um, have done things that have gone a little bit beyond. And this year we have Will Powell, who is a, another Yorton Cup champion. Uh, he is a OCB promoter, uh, is a coach, just an all around. If you look up really awesome human being in the dictionary, uh, there's a picture of Will right there. So um, he's going to be our inductee. So we'll have an induct, uh, uh, inductination ceremony uh, right there on stage. Gives me an opportunity to say really great things about really great people. Yeah. Uh, so that show is is kind of near and dear to my heart. And then in November, I have the Battle of the Gods, my, my baby there. Um, that uh, is also a pro-am event. It is the Masters Pro. So we'll have the Masters uh, Physique classic physique and bodybuilding and all the open divisions again and uh, that show is just a just a really fun show for us to uh, promote it uh, it takes its lineage back into the whole greek god theme and that's how the stage is all set up in that greek mythology all the awards are based on centaurs and you know stuff like that so okay. it's a really fun really fun show to promote so we try to put some personality into our events I see that. So is this all these uh, mythical things? Is that why your podcast has its name? How does that tie into that? The Zena Bodybuilding actually came from an article I read as a child by Frank Zane. It came out in a Muscle Builder uh, magazine uh, about 1980. And okay. Frank Zane was one of my favorite bodybuilders. He was the first bodybuilder I ever saw in a contest. He's the first bodybuilder I ever saw win a contest in 1979. Wow. Uh, just a, a really great symmetrically developed physique, had the opportunity to talk to him, just a very down to earth, uh, really well connected human being. And when I read the article, it talked about how bodybuilding was such a Zen experience for him about how it interconnected uh, all the different pillars of, of, of resilience that he had, which was uh, your, your pillars of resilience are your spiritual, your right. mental uh, your emotional and your physical. And then I also like to throw family in there as well, but uh, that was it and how it tied everything together for him. And it was a grounding balancing uh, experience and not the uh, ego driven competition experience. That's part of the sport. Okay. It's part of the culture and right. you can get carried away with the ego aspect of it, how you look, but he used it as a way to always keep himself in check and to always seek self-improvement, not just improving the biceps or the triceps or the abdominals, but to improve himself as a person, intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And I went, okay, wow, okay, this is connect. This is this sport of bodybuilding is connecting with me even more. Yes. And I just stayed with it. And that is what I find to be the most important aspects of the sport. Uh, not, you know, not how you look on stage because it's fleeting. It, right. It's who you are. 
And that's why I always characterize the greatest bodybuilders are the bodybuilders that I meet in their defeat, not in their victory. Meaning okay. I have, after competing in 150, 160 shows, I've seen so many bodybuilders win shows, um, but I've seen a thousand times that lose events. Right. So don't show me who you are as a person when you win. Show me who you are as a person when you don't win and what you do after that how you treat okay. others, how you treat yourself, and how you rebound from that experience. And that's wow. how I judge my characters. I've, I've never uh, sought out to make friends with the champion of a show um, because they've won. I don't know who you are as a person, but I've always reached out to those people who didn't do as well, but took away a very positive experience and used that to motivate themselves for further change. Those are the people I wanna connect with because hey. that's real. That, that, that's people, that, that's what we need more of in the world. More people that can see, um, you know, see themselves uh, for what they really are, the good and the bad, and then try to improve upon that. And that's why I like the Zen of bodybuilding. Well, staying with the Zen of bodybuilding, <laughs> when is this podcast? Where can we find it? Please tell people. <laughs> okay, it is on Besides Spotify. Besides on our webpage. <laughs> it's on Spotify and it is on iTunes. Uh, and it's also carried on other um, web housing, um, different different web housing places. But I, I think 95% of the people use either Spotify or iTunes. It's on both. Uh, just uh, Google Zen of Bodybuilding. You just go in there and look for the Zen of Bodybuilding. Uh, we're three episodes in. I release the episodes on the 1st and the 15th of every month. And the episodes are kind of set up. I talk a little bit about the OCB, but it's not an OCB podcast. Um, I talk a little bit about it because people always see me and they know uh, I'm involved in running the organization uh, in part of the ownership group. So they know that. And so they automatically ask me OCB questions. So I try to get something OCB organizationally thrown out there at the beginning to answer questions that people have. Then I'll go into an interview with somebody within the sport. Uh, I uh, cover a little bit of the history of bodybuilding because I really love history. And it's important for us to know where we came from and where our roots are. Uh, and the history, uh, our history in the sport or the history of bodybuilding, it goes back a lot further than the 1800s. It goes all the way back into 600 BC and, and, and beyond. Yeah, we talk wow. a little about that. A little bit of questions and answers stuff. And, uh, and that's it. I try to wrap an episode up in... 35 to 45 minutes, I think is good, uh, oh. is, is, a, is a good cut uh, cut line for an episode. And we try to drop two a month. That's the goal. Okay. So. And I know you also have a podcast for the military side of your life. I do. <laughs> I do. Uh, that one is not, uh, it, it's not specifically my podcast. I am uh, the co-host of it. It, it came about uh, from an idea I was talking to our public affairs at the 102nd Intelligence Wing, where uh, I was at the time, um, I, I've now moved into a different position. And we have a great public affairs team. I mean, some of the products they put out, uh, National Guard and Air Force wise, wide, are award winning. And I just had a conversation one day with um, Tim Sandlin, who is uh, our civilian director of public affairs over there, and uh, Francesca Skridoulis, who is uh, an airman who is my co-host on it. Like, hey, have you guys ever thought about doing a podcast where we, you know, you, you interview like a really senior person and you interview at the same time a really junior person and you ask them questions and you get the perspective from both ends of the conversation. And that way, you know, junior people in an organization will understand how, um, you know, the, the senior non-commissioned officers think and vice versa. And just kind of bridge that understanding. And Tim Sandlin, in typical Tim Sandlin fashion, sounds like it sounds great, Sully. And why don't you and Francesca plan on the next episode? <laughs> on, and, and that's where it came from. It's called Chevrons, a podcast for the enlisted force. Uh, it, it has a really good listenership. It's not so much a, a 100 second intelligence wing product anymore. It's morphed into kind of a, uh, a National Guard product because I interview people all over. Um, we also interview people from other services. And some, uh, I have some great interviews coming up with some uh, Congressional Medal of Honor winners and some people that have served in, with distinction in the military and then have gone on to do stellar things outside of the military, uh, all enlisted. That, that's the caveat. They have to be enlisted, okay. um, not officers. Uh, I have served as both an officer and then uh, in, in, when I was in the Army and now I'm back being enlisted. 
Um, so nothing against people in the officer corps that are listening. I have a great appreciation. Uh, I was there, um, but I try to target the enlisted corps. And we have uh, some people coming on who have gone on to do great things in, in both politics and uh, in government, different things like that, uh, talking about the lessons that they learned mm -hmm. through being an enlisted member and how they translated into what they did afterwards, whether starting a company from scratch and now having you know, a great company or uh, another individual we got coming up to talk to um, started a, um, a company called uh, Operation Zero, Justin Miller. Uh, he was a uh, soldier and uh, he had a, uh, a bad night one night where he became almost suicidal and called the VA and didn't get the answers that he wanted. And he said, you know, we need to have an organization that, that you know, a veteran to veteran outreach when people are on the verge and they're feeling, you know, um, uh, off that they have that immediate response. And he started uh, Operation Zero Oz. Uh, and there's an app for that. And that's how it works. Okay. And it's just a really great organization. But those are the things that we talk about and the people we talk to, people who have served uh, or are serving uh, in the Air Force or in any branch of the military service okay. and have and the lessons that they're learning to be better leaders and to uh, develop others and to be better mentors and wingmen and to be more resilient. That's what we talk about. And we've had a lot of non-military listeners reach out to us and, and compliments. I, I learned something. I learned how to be a better boss or I learned how to be a better employee. I learned how to right. be a better listener. I learned how to be more resilient because of what you were doing in the Air Force and with that podcast. So uh, if anybody out there wants to give it a listen, it's really fun. And my co-host is awesome. And the people we interview are just fantastic. It's uh, so I know what it's like to be in your seat. <laughs> All right. It can be fun. It can you be fun. wear many different hats. I bow to you, sir. You wear so many hats. It's like, okay. Speaking of hats, because you did mention the podcast, or we did just, just talk about it. I want to take a moment and thank you for your service. Um, my, my dad was in military. My brother was in military. Uh, I got, you know, cousins and aunts and uncles and we're, we're, you know, there's a lot of different types of stripes, but we're all, we all mesh together <laughs> in the family. So, you know, I, I grew up with the sir, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, <laughs> the whole nine, um, but I'm still a brat. No, uh, <laughs> but you're sitting there in a barracks, taking the time to talk I to him, <laughs> which is like, oh my gosh. Um, I want you to be safe and I want you to be careful. I know that you probably always are as much as you can be. I know that we're going through like just crazy times right now. I, I personally didn't think that we would get back to where we were having this kind of warring going on again. And, you know, I am a civilian, so maybe I'm a little naive, <laughs> but I thought we had evolved just a little bit. And as a people, and, you know, we weren't falling back into this, this craziness of just crazy, it but is. It is. yeah, it yeah. Um, what I can say is that the men and women of, of this country who served in the armed forces are in this generation among the best in that, that I have ever seen. Um, I started my military journey in 1983 in the Marines, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, spent time in the army as well. And I have to say from our youngest airman and soldier and Marine and sailor, uh, we also have now we have our space force and our coast yes. guard. Um, yes. we, we combine to be the United States armed forces, but I have to say that I walk away from every conversation I have, whether it is with a brand new 18 year old airman basic or it is with a 59 year old um, major general. I walk away from every conversation just so thoroughly impressed with what we put forth as our product in the military, the professionalism, uh, the way that we've empowered our military people to, uh, to make decisions at the lowest level, to just be the best, and, and, and they are the best. It, it is my, it's such a privilege to have my current position and to serve them. Because when you reach the top of the hierarchy, it is it, it quit being about you a long time ago. And it is 100% about them. Uh, and, and 
the people I work for. They are my mojo. They are my life. And they, it, it's just incredible. It's like every day I come to work, it is like being backstage at the greatest bodybuilding event in the world where everything is just clicking and everybody's getting along. And it's just that, you know, that, that, that intoxicating environment that, yes. a, that a show can have when it's just yes. clicking. Every day I come to work, that's what I have. Wow. So I'm the luckiest man in the world. I'll miss All it right. when it's gone, but I am building my bench and I will have a whole slew of uh, younger, smarter, better looking people that are going to take over for me as soon <laughs> as I pass the torch and, and more power to them. We are in good hands in this country. Uh, but yes, it is scary time, but we are in great hands. And as leadership, uh, all the moms and dads that are out there listening that, uh, you know, you have children serving, we will take care of them because we care about them. A leadership from the top down, uh, from chief of staff of the Air Force all the way down, we care about them. They're our greatest commodity and we love them and care about them as if they're our own. So we will take care of them. That's just amazing that you would say that. Um... <clears throat> I, I know that that, you know, people are just, you know, at their unease, you know, they're, they're, you, what do you say at this point? You know, you just, for me, I was just like, uh, like, I, I can't, but huh, to lighten the mood, <laughs> to move on a little bit. Um, like I said, I am listening to your podcast. If you could, if you would share a little bit about your, um, I guess, jump or leap into bodybuilding and what made you want to do this sport this great because most people even today they're still like you do what why do you do that like you're starving yourself why <laughs> it, it's funny I, I i bypassed that question so often yeah and it was such it was such a personal thing to me that that not a lot of people knew about it um i did release a training manual uh years and years and years ago um, called the Peak Physique, and and I wrote a little bit, maybe a paragraph and a half about it in there, but I, I kind of kept it as an interpersonal journey. And then my wife, Susan, was so um, impressed by that story and felt that it would resonate and help so many other people that about five or six years ago, she started urging me to just tell people, about, tell tell the story, tell what happened. And I covered it in the podcast, but but here it is again. And, and I, I share now because I think that there are people out there would identify from it, but uh, I, I'm going to begin by saying I loved my mom. She, she's passed away, but I loved her very much. She was the greatest person in the world. Uh, she was a captain in the Air Force at one point. She was a nurse for the Apollo astronaut program. Uh, wow. She was just a wonderful person, but she had a demon. She was an alcoholic. And I grew up without a father. And there were times in our life where we were doing okay. And there's times in our life that we were homeless. And one of those occasions, uh, we were we were homeless at the time. Uh, we were living in a van uh, in an alley in Fifth Avenue in Columbus, Ohio. And I had gotten into a situation at school. Um, I had a couple of learning disabilities that were undiagnosed uh, that I have conquered uh, through sheer force of will. So you can conquer dyslexia. You can conquer perception problems and other learning disabilities. Uh, you can. They, they are not a death sentence. And, and you can be extremely successful in life. Many people are. Uh, but it was just a bad road, and I was had been thrown out of school, uh, well, suspended. I was on a long-term 10-day suspension and wandering the streets of Columbus, and I happened to go by a health food store, and there was a bodybuilding seminar going on, and I was a real comic book junkie. Uh, Batman was my favorite, probably because it was so broody and, you know, like, you know, moody, you know, but he was just a big jacked guy, you know, and I'm looking at, and it was Frank Zane was one of them. <laughs> and they're doing a seminar, and I'm looking at these physiques, and I go in. Uh, and to make a long story short, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was there. And they're doing the questions and answers after. But you could tell that all these people are talking, and they're the ones with their shirt off. But the guy who was running, the guy who was really in charge of this entire <laughs> enterprise was the guy who you could tell even in clothes was jacked. But in a button-up shirt that's standing there with this other guy uh, named Jim, you could tell that they were running this whole thing. And everybody, when it was question answers time, was going to that guy to answer questions, not the guys with their shirts off. Ah. And I, I ended up talking to him briefly, and I think he realized uh, my situation. And he ended up uh, giving me a couple of tickets to the Mr. Olympia. And 
the funny thing is, uh, and this is what I always like to talk about, these, these chance moments, these chance encounters, these once in a lifetime opportunities that we as human beings can do to turn around and make a total difference in somebody's life. I can guarantee that if you talk to Arnold Schwarzenegger about it right now, he would have little or no recollection because I was probably one of a thousand people that he did that to because at the time bodybuilding wasn't pop. Let's face it. Why did I get tickets? Bodybuilding wasn't popular. Um, he's trying to fill this, 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 the stadium and he happened to have like 10 tickets there and there weren't enough people left in there to hand them out to. So I got two. That's the real reason. But to a 13 year old kid who is undergoing you know, all that stress in life and doesn't have a direction, that one act of kindness, I ran home to the van, woke my mom up. She sobered up for about two seconds and went, oh my God, my son is finally into something. We're going to go. Two nights later, we're at the Mr. Olympia contest and I'm watching Frank Zane win Mr. Olympia. And I was hooked with this sport ever since then. Uh, and it, it was kind of a life-changing experience for me. And I found that and I realized along my journey, uh, you know, I started digesting everything there was about bodybuilding. You know, I know we'll talk about, uh, you know, picturing in your mind that your biceps are like a mountain and that's how he made his biceps. And I remember, well, that's really cool. I'm going to do that too. And then I'd start picturing in my mind getting an A in school. I had never seen a, I didn't know the alphabet went past D. All right, because <laughs> that's where my grade level was. I'm like, I, I'm going to picture A's and I got an A. And then I started picturing other things in life and they started manifesting stuff. Okay. It, it, it is true manifest destiny. And I realized that if you can change your mind, then you can change your world and we can change the world one person at a time. Uh, but that, that's kind of my story. That's why um, I, I always encourage people, those little random acts. Uh, I, <laughs> uh, Another personal one, and I, I'm going to share this. This is not about me story. It kind of about me, but it's not an about me story. It's not like a like me thing. I just want to say this out. People want, listening, little things like this can happen. So I have this thing I do. I go in and I get a cup of coffee. And whenever I'm in uniform, they give me a free cup of coffee. And I do the same thing all the time, whether it was back in my police uniform, my military uniform. I buy a coffee and I say the next person through, you know, tell them that a stranger bought him a cup of coffee and have a nice day. All right. So. I do this all the time. Now, I'm listening to one of my, my favorite talk radio stations. You know, the people, guests are calling or whatever. And somebody was calling in. They, they, they were talking about sports. And then they were talking about something else. And uh, one of the athletes was having a really bad day. And this guy goes, oh, hey, I live on the Cape. And I was in Falmouth one time. And I was, I was, it was the worst day of my life. I was contemplating doing something dreadful. And I wanted to get my last cup of coffee. And it was free because a stranger bought me a cup of coffee. And it totally changed my mind. And that's why I'm so behind, you know, suicide prevention. So, and I'm driving along and I'm going, I wow. wonder if it was me. <laughs> I'm in Falmouth all the time. I've been yes. doing this forever. I wonder if it was me. It might not have been. It could have been another stranger. But I just thought about it and I went, well, there's, there's the full circle. It, it, that's how a chance encounter with Arnold yeah. or doing kind act for a stranger, you never know how it's going to resonate or change. Exactly. So, um, I consider myself a, you know, uh, I guess a warrior monk. Um, I you could be a I've warrior monk. War. Why not? <laughs> I have been to war multiple times. I've seen the worst. Um, I have been on the front lines as a SWAT officer and a police officer and a sniper, and I've done it all. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that you can't you you can't be a warrior and portray strength, but at the same time have humanity, and right. and understand what humanity is. You know, there's exactly. there's a time and a place. So. Uh, so the, yeah, that, that's kind of how I got into the sport and why after 40 years, I'm still involved and want to stay involved and keep giving back to our athletes and keep giving back to, to the people, uh, people that are involved in the sport, uh, people like yourself who are getting ready to promote your first event that I can't wait to be part of. <laughs> so awesome. excited. So now it's so my excited. turn to interview you. So tell <laughs> me about your first event. When is it going to be and where? <laughs> well, this is my first event with the OCB. Like I said, I have lots of friends in other places. So this is very exciting for me because I love that they they stand behind and they stand for doing it naturally. Because on the on the flip side of it, I know a lot of people have hurt themselves trying to be the best of the best. And it's it's so cool when you can see like someone 
working out or staying fit or, or competing with their son or with their daughter. You know, like they're making this a family event. <laughs> this is so cool. Um, so it's not like, you know, just them. It's, you can tell this is like something they've ingrained in their kids. So now that child who's going to be in, let's say the teen division, we get to see him when he's an 80 year old person, still healthy, still. So that <laughs> makes me like, yes, this is a cool thing to be doing. Um, because when I first started, people were like, you know, you must be on this, this, and the other. And I was just like, you know what? I'm not. <laughs> but um, it was really, you know, it was crazy. But I love that the OCB, you know, promotes and instills and like kind of drills home. You know, you can do this in a healthy way and you can do it for a lifetime and make your life even better. So. Um, Lorraine and I are just like pinching ourselves every day when we have, um, the show's not until October, it's October 22nd, it's the OCB Stone Classic in South Carolina, Myrtle Beach. <laughs> um, when we talked to you and you were like, sure, I'll be there. We're like, what? <laughs> and then we got our first sponsor and we were like, what? <laughs> and then we got our first, first competitor and we're like, what? So yeah, we, we, we do like the happy dance. I literally have a video of Lorraine doing the happy dance. I don't know if she'll let me use it. <laughs> but that's awesome. You, you know, from the regular job to, you know, doing this, it definitely gives you like that, like, I don't know. It's just that feeling where you're like, yes. And I've, I've been like from tanning to, oh my gosh, expediting, emceeing, you name it, <laughs> dragging people out of the bathroom, whatever is needed <laughs> to get the job done. Um, I've been in and around it. And clearly I must love it because I keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. So um, yeah, you just have to be like Yvonne and I'm like, yes, let's go. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter where, when, how, like, let's, let's do it. So I had the opportunity to, um, to, co-promote with Lorraine and that's Lorraine to pass by the way and she's an amazing person um I don't know if you've ever seen her sing acapella oh. when, when oh. she ah, I'm telling I'm glad I'm telling tell I went to one of her competitions and um I forgot the name of the the head judge there but she said she's been doing this like 20 years and she told her she's like I've never seen someone do that so you know it's it's kind of odd in this sport for something new to be <laughs> taking place and it was so funny because you could tell the audience wasn't sure they were like is she singing or is that is that is that a record what's going on <laughs> you, could tell, you could tell and then like they figured out oh god she really is singing like live <laughs> acapella and they were like oh my god you know like they started clapping even harder so you could tell they were like what's going on what's happening she's singing <laughs> That's awesome. Now I know. I can't yes. wait. To, I cannot wait to uh, pull that out of my head at my next show. Uh, yes. If she's there, I might have to turn around and go and singing the national anthem. Right. <laughs> and the mic and put her on the spot, right? She will kill me, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. Yes. Yes. Um, let's see. So we talked about military, OCB, your life, your shows that are coming up. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about this oh, evening? Oh boy, I mean, I could talk about my kids, my wife, my, yes. uh, you know, my 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 grandchild. Uh, oh really? You know, all that. Oh, I'm a grandpa. Yeah, yeah, oh. I'm a grandpa. Now, now my uh, my oldest daughter lives in Oklahoma, and okay. I'm on the East Coast, so uh, right. I'll be flying out again to uh, to see my. My grandson again soon. Uh, he is a terror. Um, That's a and I, he just will, there's nothing he can't climb. There's nothing he can't do. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, at, uh, yeah, um, I would say that the, the first, uh, the first uh, almost three years have been wonderful. And I, I know that my, my daughter is, going to be having a, a fun more 16 years so <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah uh I, I try to uh have time uh, as much time as I can spend at home uh you know with my family I've got two two stepsons 
Um, and uh, so I, I think that family can be very important. Uh, I also know how challenging parenthood can be. Right, uh, right. But at the same time, you know, seeing who they develop into as people, it, it, I think that's really rewarding. Uh, my youngest daughter is just just awesome, uh, just a, just a thoughtful, you know, kind-hearted, wonderful person. Uh, my oldest daughter is is just brilliant and probably very much like me, very much uh -huh. like me. As a matter of fact, brilliant. if she was in the military, she'd probably be a general by now. All uh, right, now. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so they're they're great. Yeah. And my wife is is you know the, the the secret behind the success. You know she's she's behind me at everything I do. So uh, I always like to acknowledge them and thank them. You know that you know they're awesome. Uh, oh, well, but we keep into the we keep bodybuilding and family. I, what people don't realize is that my former spouse Deb she promotes the spirit of America in uh, Massachusetts on Cape Cod, uh, oh, okay. and that uh, it, her and Kayla, my daughter, uh, promote that. You know, so people you know don't don't uh, don't realize that you don't have to be a competitor you don't have to ever have been involved in the sport to promote and put together and hold and have a really fantastic event uh you know like the spirit of america i mean it 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 the, it's actually the longest running show in the ocb continuous wow. yes uh Look it's the longest that. continuous it there there uh, we started the Spirit of America the second year that the OCB was founded. Uh, that was because the first year Matt did it, he just promoted three shows on his own and called it OCB. And then the following year, I'm like, hey Matt, I, let's make it a federation. I'll jump in. Uh, and a guy uh, by the name of Roger in Pittsburgh jumped in. And uh, uh, but um, the the Spirit of America has never missed a year since then. You know, and other shows have been like the pre presidential cup. They've missed a few years. The Jordan Cup started late. So all these shows that have a following in elite, the spirit of America is the, probably the, the long, it, not probably, but is the longest continuously year by year running show. So if anybody's looking to compete in May, they're okay. around the Massachusetts area. There's the spirit that. of America. So, yeah. That's and, awesome. So yeah, speaking so, of the book that I'm going to make you write. <laughs> okay. I think you have like at least five. You know, I say every person has one. I think you I like have my one. wife. <laughs> yeah, I think you have about five or so. I love that you know the history of this sport and can just run off and talk about it like it's, you know, it just happened a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I also think by you doing the podcast, it'll give some people more insight to like how it all came to be, how things developed, how things have progressed um it's it's always good to know like why things are the way they are now kind of thing um yeah so <clears throat> when's when's that book coming up <laughs> <laughs> no pressure uh, i know you're busy it's, but when, when? it's funny because uh I, i've had multiple people turn around and say the same thing and if people who know me from you know my police career who have no idea that I'm involved in bodybuilding and barely know I'm in the military say so you should write a book about your experiences there. My military people who don't know about that. So it's like all these these worlds, how they converge together. Uh it it would be interesting. Um, you know, I I I really had I I consider myself a poor man's force gump. Okay. Uh, and, and anybody who's ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, yes, he just ends up in all these wonderful situations more by accident than anything else. Okay. And that's kind of how my life has been. Uh, I, I know internally there's been a lot of drive. There's there's always been a, you know a desire for growth. There's always been that that connection. So uh, I'm a little more connected. Uh, to the my situations and things that have happened as Forrest Gump, but I, I just look at just like even some of the the sub stories. I, I, I we're talking the other day, and you know, uh, and uh, we we're, uh, were talking about you know um, music stars and who you like, and Rod Stewart came up, and I, uh, I'm showing people pictures of when I met Rod Stewart in uh, on a, when he was on a vacation in Thailand in 1984, and how we we hung out, and you know we were like chatting. You know, People are like, you just say it so casually. I'm like, yeah, I was just a ran into Rod Stewart, ran into this person, ran into, it, it. I and that's where, um, where people have always said that would make your book so much fun because you've you've 
you've had all those chance encounters with all these people and all these variety of disciplines and different things right. they've done, as well as, you know, your story, you know, your path of how you went from, you know, there to here. Yes. Um, people seem to find it interesting. So maybe someday I think okay. it'd be the most boring story in the world because it's my no. life. I don't think I'm, you know, uh, I, I don't think I'm all that, uh, but. I love how humble you are, sir, but I think there's, it entertains like people, I said, maybe. at least five books in there at a minimum. Just, well, I, I already have a title, you know, I, I'm just a guy. It's a story just about just being a guy, uh, you I'm know, it, guy. And, and the potential that we all have. I mean, that's the one reason why I think I would, I would ever even endeavor to write about that right. because uh, there's so much out there about about rock stars and about movie stars and about sports stars, about superstars and about all these other stars. And uh, one of my 10, 10 philosophies that I always uh, tell my soldiers and, and airmen and stuff when I talk to them is that if you're gonna be a star, be a North Star. It's not the brightest star, it's not the most popular star, it's not the most famous star, but it's a guiding star. So if you're gonna ah. be a star, be a North Star. And, you know, and, and, and be grounded and be humble and know yourself and guide and help others. And that's what we need more of. We, we need, of all the celestial bodies, we need a few more North Stars. Okay. And a few less rock stars and sports stars and movie stars, <laughs> reality stars. And, I understand what you're uh, saying. So Yes, I, I yeah. love like motivational things. And I listen to a lot of different uh, folks. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, Lisa Nichols, and she has, I'm probably going to butcher the way she says it, but she says, you want to make me extraordinary to let yourself off the hook, meaning that she's just like you and I, but everybody goes, oh my gosh, you know, you're like this person who's done this and that and this and the other. She said, you know, she gets out of bed one foot at a time. <laughs> she She goes through bumps, highs and lows like everyone else, but that's what people want to do. They want to make someone, you know, so extraordinary to it's like, it's untouchable. And I, I feel like, you know, like, just like now, I mean, Lorraine and I were like, do you think Sully can talk to us? And you were like, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> talking about those little moments that make people be like, hey, you know, like I'm having a good day. Now that might have, as you would say, that might not have been much to you, or this interview even might not be much to you, but to me, it's it's made my month, man. <laughs> like we haven't even got to a show, and I'm okay. I'm okay. So I appreciate. I appreciate you. you. I appreciate <laughs> you very much, and I appreciate what you're doing. And also, I wouldn't have been on if it wasn't that I I I understand the tone and tenor of your show, and I understand what you really wanted to get after, and that and that's the important stuff. Uh, people are sometimes afraid to reveal their humanity. They they want to hide behind their they want to hide behind their label. You know, they want to hide behind themselves as the sports star or as the pretty model or as the handsome actor or whatever it is they do, and they don't want people to see, you know beyond the mask. Uh, I think that's why I identify with Batman so much because, you know, behind the mask, there's such a complex character there uh, that's going through so much and has overcome so much. And everyone's Batman. Everyone is Batman. Every single person out there is a superhero of some type and is a Batman, um, you know, uh, or you know, Batgirl, whatever. They, they're, you know, Everybody has that. That that's the reality of it. And if we all realize that we're all human and we all do things the same way, it's just some people have different opportunities. Some people call it blind luck. Some people are born lucky. Some people are born rich. Some people are not. Some people make themselves rich. Um, I, I feel like I am one of the richest people in the world. Um, but I'm rich in the way that I want to be rich. I know. I know that had I had I wanted to be a multi-billionaire, I would have been one by now. I, I have no doubt about it. If I wanted to be a politician, I would be a senator right now. But I've become all the things that I've really truly desired in my heart to be and to become because those are the things I feel that made me rich. And wealth to me isn't uh, something that is in currency. Wealth is something that you develop within your character. Being able to look yourself in the eye and be proud of what you've done, uh, and, and acknowledging 
your own defeats and learning from them and improving from them as as a bodybuilder or as a person, uh, as a police officer, a teacher, or a you know doctor, whatever you are, you know, uh, you don't learn from your successes; you learn from your defeats and overcoming them, and that's where you develop, and that's where everybody becomes Batman and develops their own superhero ness. You know, Batman started off as a victim. And then true. he became Gotham City's greatest crime fighter. That's so true. Uh, people always talk. It's another uh, one of my 10 monikers. Uh, it, you know, um, you have three choices in adversity. You can either be you can either be um, the victim or you can be the survivor or you can be the warrior. And what's the difference between the survivor or the warrior? The survivor survives the experience. The warrior embraces the experience for the good and the bad and and, and attacks it with the mindset and the ferocity of a warrior no matter what it is, um, they attack it and, and they beat it and they become better. So uh, I think that people who call themselves survivors are not survivors, they're warriors. I think, you know, survivors, you, you don't hear from survivors. I think, um, I, I think you hear from the warriors. So I think people need to realize that they have that inner strength and that they are warriors and that they've truly overcome something, no matter what it is, domestic violence, uh, uh, illness, um, substance abuse or just people who weren't happy with who they were it doesn't have to be extreme you know if if you're unhappy with who you are and be a better person and you can you can yes. people can change i believe yes. that people can change i have i have yes. i can i can attest to it people can change yes i believe they can too i'm so glad that you took the time to do this with us today um thank you we're going to definitely add all of your show information on there, your podcast information on there. I'm going to leave that line for the book that's coming soon. <laughs> we'll start off with the first one, um, just a guide. And I'm looking forward to, of course, seeing you throughout the year. And um, I can't thank you enough for doing this. It was my pleasure. And, uh, and thank you very much for having me on. And thank you. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.